Wow. Well, good evening again, ladies. It's been an amazing midweek thus far. Um, I'm so grateful. Um, you know, I think that it's so interesting to me how like the end of the year serves as a time of reflection, reflection and like, um, what's it? Reflection and assessment. So you can go into the new year renewed. And I definitely agree. I think someone shared about just having refreshment from the conference. It was amazing. Um, different lessons impacted my heart and the different times with people we spent. So I figured my word for this year is tenacity. Yes. And so like, okay, so tenacity. And I, I used to think of myself as like, I just want to be resilient. Resilient is like able to weather the storm, endure, right? But tenacious is someone who like goes after it. Like it's like being on the offensive instead of the defensive. So that's my like word of the year is tenacity, right? But the title of my lesson today is called Stretch Out Your Hand. And turn your Bibles to Mark chapter three. And the scripture we, we're gonna be studying out or what we're gonna be studying out is Jesus helping um, a man who had a shriveled hand. And in Mark chapter three, um, we'll start in verse five, but I don't know if you know this, but the word hand or hands appears in the Bible over 1900 times. The usage of the word hand in Hebrew or, um, Sonia might butcher this, Yad, um, oh yes, um, it's associated with strength, authority, and power. Thus the term hand is associated with power or authority distribute it through your hand. And so the other, and we're going to look at a few scriptures about that, but the other um, association can be associated, associated with prayer, submission, and reverence um, for God. And in 1 Timothy 2.8, the Bible says, therefore I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. And so I was thinking about this, and there are a few notable scripture references um, when God told Noah, uh, when God gave the charge to Noah in Genesis 9 verse 2, he says, the fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and on all the birds in the sky, on every creature that moves along the ground and on all the fish in the sea. They are given into your hands. So this is an example of God giving Noah authority. God also has a hand reference to Joseph in Genesis 39, verse two to three, and you can reference these, you don't have to turn here, but it says the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man and was, he was in the house of the Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. And so this is an example of favor, power, and strength. Even though Joseph was essentially enslaved at this time, God gave him power and strength through his hands. And the title of the lesson again is called Stretch Out Your Hands. And to stretch means to cause someone or something to make maximum use of their talents or abilities. Or to adapt or extend the scope of something in a way that exceeds a reasonable or acceptable limit. And so when we're spiritually stretched or when we're called to stretch out our hands, it means that God wants to extend and grow our faith, love and holiness in order to bring more glory to him. So sisters, are you ready to stretch out your hands in 2024? Um, and if you look in Mark 3, that's going to be our text scripture today. Um, here we have Jesus and starting in verse 1, Mark chapter 3, verse 1. It says, another time Jesus went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them and in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. So point number one is stand up in front of everyone. And in verse three, Jesus tells this man to stand up in front of everyone. And you got to understand 
this man was deformed, he had a shriveled hand, and this is one of the few accounts that Jesus offered a miracle to someone who wasn't actually looking for one. This man was not, he didn't ask Jesus to stretch out his hand, he didn't ask for healing, he was simply there participating, listening in in the synagogue. And I do believe that this man was religious and wanted to know God because why else would he be there? Like why be at, you know, a synagogue if you're not wanting to hear about God or religious teachings? But the scriptures show no eagerness or intent of him focusing on being healed. So he was intentionally not wanting to be noticed by anyone in the synagogue. Why? Because he was deformed. And many of us that know you know, scriptural history in the Jewish culture, a deformity was seen as shameful, but most importantly, it was believed that if you had a deformity, you were seen as cursed by God. Yeah. And I believe this man, like many of us at times, had settled to live an average, private, and anonymous life. And he hid his deformity and that, um, hiding his performity protected him from having to deal with the shame and his weakness head on. But Jesus makes note to call him out. He says, hey, you gotta stand up in front of everyone. And note, before Jesus healed him, he told him to stand up in front of everyone. And so I believe that there are two reasons that Jesus wanted him to stand up in front of everyone, and two reasons Jesus wants us to stand up in front of everyone. The first one was, I believe, he was teaching the Pharisees to expose their hearts, um, and they were looking for a reason to accuse him. So Jesus was showing them um, he was about to show them a miracle and his authority to heal. But I believe the second reason applies to us, that Jesus wanted to teach the man the power of facing your fears and weaknesses and vulnerability and faith. And let me ask you something. Do you stand up in front of everyone and share your weaknesses, vulnerabilities, and faith and humility and sincerely? And this is what I really evaluated about myself last year. I'm like, there was amazing things that happened in my life last year. I wrote down my, um, every year OJ and I do, um, we do like a, a prayer list, but then we also do a goals list. And three of my six prayers came true on my prayer list. So the first one, um, it was a miracle. He allowed me to be reinstated as a women's ministry leader. That had been a prayer for four or five years. Um, he allowed me to go back to, into the full-time ministry by coming here. And, you know, I randomly, um, this probably wasn't good then, but I put, I put that I wanted to move to another city. Um, and he allowed me to do that. So three, three out of, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying, like, anyway. Um, but as I assessed, I realized that there were two sinful areas that I allowed to plague me and chip at my faith. And that was fear and insecurity. And... There were times when either I felt one of these things or both of these things, like they were debilating. Like I was like fearful all the time. Like um, honestly, I felt like sometimes I was on the verge of like paranoia. I remember there'd be times I'd like, um, I'd be sitting out in my car, it's nighttime, and then um, I just need to go from my car to the door. And I'm like, OJ, can you look outside so I can walk in? <laughs> because I would be just scared. And I, guys, I can't tell you why, like it's not like, something specific happened. I just think that something in me, or maybe, I don't know, like in a, a satanic attack, I was just scared and fearful very deeply. And I felt like that plagued me last year. Um, and there was another time when OJ went out of town on a retreat and I was there with uh, Micah and I, um, and I shared this with Sonya the next day and I woke up in the middle of the night and I just was like, I felt like I couldn't move. Like I was just having heart palpitations and I was so, scared and I was just like laying there praying like God just help me not to fear and I think things like that we feel uh, or we potentially feel or other things that plague us but it's hard for us to talk about because we don't want to stand up in front of everyone you know and so there were times when I prayed about it or you know I even did bible studies on it but these things I realized shipped away at my faith and they caused me to be um I would say less visionary and um, started to be faithless in those areas. Like, you know, as we grow spiritually, you know, we, we change. We no longer go out to clubs. We no, we no longer do all these outward things, but you have to take care of those inner things as well that are chipping at your faith. And so I wanted to stand up in front of everyone and say, hey, this year, no more. You know, like 
hold me accountable because I don't want to be plagued by that, like in the chains of fear and these, these inward things that just take hold of us and cause us to not live the life that God is destined for us. And so I want to ask you, what is something last year, or maybe even now, that's plaguing you? Um, and if, there, if it's nothing, amen. Pray for the rest of us. But if it's something, like be open about it. And that's what Jesus was trying to get this man to do. He wanted him to face his fears and his shame head on because Jesus no longer wanted him to live that way anymore. And so I want to share a scripture in Hebrews chapter 4. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. And so I love this scripture because Jesus has been tempted in every way, and he's able to empathize with all of our weaknesses. So you have him to go to whenever you're tempted, whenever you're plagued, whenever you're struggling, and, but the Bible says he did not sin. And so what that teaches us is that we have the power to be tempted in every way, but overcome through Jesus. And I want to lift up a sister. Um, her name is Kaylin. Um, Kaylin, I want to lift you up because um, we, were, we were doing a Bible study with Lana uh, Saturday night after the um, banquet. And it was late. It was like 11 o'clock. And we finished the study. We were, we were going home. And she's like, hey, can I give you a call? And honestly, whenever when somebody says that, I'm like, oh, like, <laughs> like, what just happened? But she was like, she, I was like, yeah, sure, I was still up. And um, she's like, hey, I just want to say, if there was any way you felt like I wasn't humble in that Bible study, please just let me know. And I was like, wait, what? Like, it's 1130 at night, and she's concerned about whether she came off, by the way, like she was extremely humble, like offered great insight. I didn't even think about that, but she's like, because that's what I'm trying to work on. And you inspired, convicted and inspired me because I was like, wow, that was on your heart at 1130 at night. At 1130 that night, I was thinking about sleeping. And you were, you were like thinking about your spirituality and I just want to say, like, you are, you, that in and of itself is what you're showcasing what you wanted to grow in. Right. Because that was standing up and just sharing vulnerably about that, but you were completely humble in that situation. So I just want to lift you up for that. But, again, the first step is owning where you're at and just being excruciatingly vulnerable and real about these things with God and those close to you. And... I believe that God does not want us to hide in the baggage or sweep these weaknesses under the rug. He just simply wants us to stand up in front of everyone and he'll help us. And so my practical from this point is write down the toughest sin or challenge you are struggling to overcome today and share it with three women in your life to pray, help, and hold you accountable. And my next point is simply called stretch out your hand. And so in verse five, the Bible says, in Mark 3, verse 5, he looked around at them in anger and deeply distress at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely healed or restored. Remember the, this, the two reasons that Jesus had this miracle. It was to show the glory of God and to expose the legalism of the Pharisees and help them see their hearts. But why do I share this? Because Jesus was asking this man to do something seemingly impossible in a harsh, intense situation. Like, can you ma imagine having a shriveled hand and someone asking you to stretch it out? That's cruel. You're like, why would you ask? Me? Like, we don't even like, I think that that's, that's like a, um, a societal thing we know. Like, we don't, we don't, um, uh, what is it called? Um, we don't make fun of people that we know have challenges. Like, I think whether someone has a relationship with God or not, that's just kind of like a societal rule. So you got to understand the controversy surrounding this when Jesus is asking him this. It's like, like even nowadays, if, if one of us did that, we would, some, someone might hit you like, what are you? Like, that's a quick disciple. But Jesus was asking him to do something. But I think there's a lesson we have to learn is that even though he was asking him to do something seemingly impossible, Jesus still expected him to obey. 
And let me ask you, do you disobey God when you feel the ask is unreasonable or hard? Wow. And I was thinking about this because there are some areas in my life where I'm like, yeah, like, uh, I don't know, you know. Um, over the holidays, you got to hear OJ share about our Christmas trip. And his was like, his story was like amazing. It's amazing how two people can be in the same situation and the stories be completely different. Like, he's like, oh, it was great. I mean, he, you know, he kind of had a moment about his one gift. I got more. But I felt like I was like helping my dad, helping my mom, like running around. And I would just look at OJ and he's just sitting there watching TV, like just living life. And you know what went through my mind? Martha, Martha. Like, I was just like, oh my gosh. Like, because my, my family, they don't ask him. To, I don't know if it's a man thing. They don't ask him to do stuff. They ask me. So, but anyway, I'm just being open. But anyway, um, I'm there and I'm like, wow, man, like this just seems unreasonable. You know, my parents live like 40 miles apart. So we were driving back and forth. And um, there was an incident that happened where after all of that, uh, my parents both felt that they didn't spend enough time. And I was like talking to my dad and I just started crying. Like, I was like, I don't know what to do. Like, this is all I got, you know? <laughs> and I'm crying and my dad's like, oh, cause he didn't realize how it impacted me. And I wasn't, honestly, I don't even know why I started crying. I was feeling more than I realized, but um, it just felt unreasonable. And there are times in our lives where things will feel unreasonable. Like, God, I have so much on my plate right now. Like, this just seems unreasonable. But Jesus never gives us anything in his word to do that he won't give us the strength to do. And let me show you what about this man. This man refused to argue with Jesus or even explain his deficiency to show him why he, wasn't, why he didn't think it was possible. He simply obeyed. And I believe this man understood a biblical concept that many of us fail to learn or we struggle with. That if God asks us to obey something that is seemingly impossible, again, he will give us the strength to do it. Um, and here are a few areas that we as women should consider. Are we being obedient to the scriptures in? Number one is simply devotion to him. And again, it's a heart. You know, like it's not a matter of, of time. It's not a matter of, you know, how much you read or didn't read. It's just a matter of heart. Like, you know, I know in the mornings when I was rushed. I know when I'm just like, okay, you know what? Amen. Pray real quick. All right, got to take Micah to school. You know, or you know when it's like, wow, I am at your feet, God, listening, learning. And that can be 45 minutes, but it's about the heart. The next thing is our purity. Sonia mentioned it in the, um, uh, the different sessions. We added purity because I believe purity is a huge um, topic that we have to constantly fight for. And it's so easy to be uh, impure. One of my favorite scriptures is in James. Um, I believe it's, it's, it's James chapter four and it talks about religion that is considered uh, pure is to keep oneself holy um, and to keep oneself, sorry, to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Yeah. And I love that scripture because pollution is like little particles. Like pollution isn't like, oh, I just dumped this trash on, trash on you. It's like, no, like little by little, you get dirtied up. And that's what I think happens with us with purity. Maybe you watch something that you shouldn't watch. Maybe you uh, hear a joke that you shouldn't hear. Like you can literally be walking, you can walk this bowling alley and hear impure conversation, yeah. you know, and we still have to fight to guard our minds from that. The next one is relationships with others. Um, how are they? You know, are we pure in heart and forgiving and loving in our relationships? The next one, we're women in here and a lot of, we had a lot of people showing their rings today. It's our, our submission to our spouses. It's like, how's that going? You know, I think that this is huge, you know. Um, how's your relationship with your husband? Um, and then lastly, I think one that's very huge is greed. And this is not just financially, it can be in a lot of different areas. It can be um, indulgence in food. It can be overindulging in, uh, you know, binge watching shows. All these things are greed. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we obeying the scriptures in these areas? And if you look in Philippians chapter two, verse 12, 
I love this scripture because it helps us, it helps me to know that I can overcome and obey God's word and he'll give me the strength to do it. And in Philippians 2 verse 12 to 13, it says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. So we know from the scriptures that we learn that God works in us to continue to help us to overcome and, and uh, overcome our sins and to help us fulfill his good purpose. And I believe that when we obey, God does the rest. And so I was thinking about um, in high school, when I was 16 years old, I just got my license. And you know, my, my, I come from a single family home. So my mom was like, oh, I'm gonna get you a car. And I'm very, lo- I was very logical. I'm like, mom, like, you don't make that much money. And I don't know, like, how, like where's this car gonna come from? But she just said, like, I'm gonna get you a car. I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know? But she was like, the catch is you have to get great grades. So my grades were great, good, but um, I got that semester, at the end of the semester, I got, I think, all A's and one B or something. But anyway, um, it's Christmas time, and I'm like, oh, I don't see a car. She hasn't talked about a car. But we go to my uncle's house, and so he's talking to me. He's like, yeah, your mom said you, had really, you got really great grades. And I'm like, yeah, I did. <laughs> and he's like, you know what? I was talking to your mom, and I have an extra car here. It's not much but we're gonna let you have that for getting great grades. Wow. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I just got a car. And <laughs> my older cousin, we were, were like four years apart. Um, it was his old car and he put a sound system in it. <laughs> so it wasn't just like, it wasn't just like an okay car. It was like a cool car, like with a sound system. Well, it was an old car but with a new sound system. Right. But I was so grateful. And I believe that that's like the power of obedience. I couldn't logically see it, but through just obeying my mom at the time, God worked it out. And I think God does the same thing with us. Like you don't, you can't logically see how things are going to work out. But if you obey the scriptures, God will work it out. And there's a couple areas where I just want us to focus on our obedience to Christ. And the first one is our faith as a women's ministry. And I want us to be a faith-filled group of women and continue to grow in our faith where we're like, you know what? Circumstances don't matter. What things look like don't matter. God will work it out. But the only way to build your faith is through Romans 10, 17. Hearing, uh, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. In order to have that faith, we have to stay close to him. And the second one is for us to be women of character in all parts of our life, our careers, our dating life, our marriages, our kids, our ministry. God cares about your entire life. It's not just like God just cares about this one area of your life, but he's like, I don't know about this area. It's like he cares about our entire lives, but sometimes we don't pray about our entire life. We pray about specific areas that we feel faithful in, but other areas that we don't pray about, and we wonder why like they're not changing. Pray about every area of your life because God cares about every area. And the third thing is I want us to be sisters who deeply love and support our brothers. Listen, at the end of the day, our brothers have their struggles, but you know what I think about every day? They love God. They could easily be out here doing whatever, but they're just trying to have a relationship with God. And I just want us to really deeply love and support our brothers. And the fourth one is to be women who dream. And if you haven't had a chance to write down your dreams this year, do it. What's stopping you? You know, you write them out and you beg God for them and let the chips fall where they may. And to close out, I want to share um, a song that I really am gonna have as, along with tenacity is my mantra, I have this song as like a um, theme song and it's called Different by Micah Tyler. You guys might know this. Um, Can you guys hear it? I'll just play a verse.
And the song continues on, you can listen to it, but essentially he says, I wanna be different, I wanna be changed, till all of me is gone and all that remains is a fire so bright, the whole world can see that there is something different. So come and be different, I just wanna be different. And you see what God can do when you simply stand up in front of everyone like this man with a shriveled hand and stretch out your hand in faith and God will use you powerfully. Love you guys. Amen.